Sheffield Wednesday have been everywhere and nowhere in the last five months from the despair of losing the playoff semi-final first leg 4-0 to Peterborough United and thinking they're out of it and questions over the future of manager Darren Moore which will be so ironic considering the events were to come but they came back in that second leg against Peterborough in incredibly dramatic circumstances they won on penalties then they beat Barnsley in the final to complete the most incredible turnaround in the playoffs League One has ever seen thanks to Josh Windass's 123rd minute winner but a few weeks later, negotiations between Darren Moore and Dafon uh, Chancery broke down. The club parted company with the man who took them up back up into the championship. And now they've appointed Zisco Munoz. Uh, a lot to unpack. And where does Sheffield Wednesday go from here? How can they do in their first season back in the championship after two years away? Well, to discuss all of this and more, I'm delighted to be joined by James Mappin from the Wednesday Till I Die podcast and Dan Fudge from the Wednesday Week. Uh, good evening, gents. How are we? Evening, Gabe. How's it going, mate? You all right? Yeah, very well. Thanks a lot to talk about. Uh, how are you, Dan? Yeah, not so bad. You're right, James. Not talked to you in a while. You're right, pal. <laughs> yeah, long time no speak. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hope you, t- hope you two can have a little catch up after this. Um, but I, um, before we get stuck into it, obviously got a quick service announcement, which is we're also available on YouTube and on Spotify. If you're watching this on either of those platforms, then do give us a subscribe because it helps us out a lot do like the video and drop a comment uh, with your opinions. And you can also check out the other videos. I'm covering all 72 clubs between mid-June and mid-July. So go check those out once you're done with this one. Um, coming coming to you first then, James, what's your sort of overriding emotion as a, as a Wednesday at the moment? Uh, I think it's hard to put it into just like one word, to be fair. Um, I mean, it's been a rollercoaster of emotions when you, when you think about it. You know, it, it was a... When you say as a Wednesday, I I think um, for myself, I I wasn't you know I wasn't around when in the nineties was well, I was around, but I wasn't there at Hillsborough to to witness the the glory days. So um, it's been pretty pretty bleak to be fair. There's been a few glimpses and you know a few uh, moments that have been that have been good. You know, getting to the playoff final in the in the championship with Carlos. You know what, nearly ten years ago now, but yeah, in recent in recent times, it's been it has been a little bit bleak. Um, it was just fingers crossed. And hopefully now, you know, we're back into the championship. Fingers crossed we can start progressing. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to stay in league one for too long. You know, uh, it's took us two seasons every time we've been down there, you know, on the previous two occasions. And obviously now, now this one. So I'm just thankful that we're, that we're out of there. I don't want to come across as being, you know, entitled or anything like that, but I think most people wouldn't, you know, when they saw Sheffield Wednesday in League One, they'd probably admit that you know, they don't really deserve to be there. I know we deserve to be there with what's happened, but in terms of the stature of the club and what have you, sure. you know, championships where we need to be and, and fingers crossed we can push on. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that's arrogant uh, at all. I think that's perfectly reasonable, really. Um, coming to you on this, Dan, um, I'm... I nev- would never have considered myself Darren Moore's greatest cheerleader in the world. Um, but I, I would confess that I did feel a little bit of disappointment, I suppose, even from a neutral perspective, that the club did part company with Darren Moore um, because I felt like this was an opportunity to have some stability to maybe start for the club to maybe start walking before it runs and and seeing as what he did in League One last season, which shouldn't be underestimated, you know, because 96 points was an excellent achievement, especially considering the injuries in the second half of the campaign and then to, to, to sort of come back the way he did in the playoffs. It would have been nice, I think, if the if Darren Moore and Dafon Chantieri could have found a solution. Yeah, it it, it would have been, and and you're right to to kind of feel a little bit aggrieved at, at Moore leaving. Now, James does an excellent phone in show on a on a Wednesday night, and uh, um, it, I, it, I think I was listening, James, around about March time, and even and even then, before the wheels had kind of fell off our season, there was a few people that phoned into that show who still weren't sold on Darren Moore. And um and I and I think there are a few things where it took him a while to find out his his his, his settled formation. You know, the the five at three, five, two or you know, the five at the back that he kept playing didn't really enamor people to the football. Mm. But it, it it got results, albeit via 
very mentally strenuous circumstances by the end of the season, you know. But I, I, I agree. I agree with you, Gab. There, there is a there is an element of we just want a bit of stability, you know. Sheffield Wednesday have been in the news for the right reasons, the wrong reasons, quite a lot. We've had a lot of column inches this last month, uh, you know, from being spanked four nil, from having the best comeback in in the history of the playoffs, and then and then winning in the last kick of the game in the um in the in in the playoffs, and then and then parting company with the manager it, it, it's all insane uh, but you know we found out the other day that we know given Chan Siri's statement that he made we found out that he he knew that Darren Moore was leaving when he called what he calls the fans forum where he gets in and talks about the state of the paper towels and what's going on at the club but even when he called that meeting he already knew that Darren Moore was going which kind of we've just announced the manager this evening so great great timing on picking the date for this show by the way Gab uh, but, we, but we, you know there's an element of you've had three weeks Dapon what you know what you who you, who you been talking to? What's been happening? It's it's been a while. We've already started training, pal. Did you not notice? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I want to come to you, James, on on this game, Minos. Um, I there's part of me that wonders, considering how um, in the previous era of Sheffield Wednesday, I'll call it the post Hull era, where the club made a lot of mistakes, uh, especially in terms of recruitment, and kind of looked at a combination of agent led approaches. And also a little bit of surface level in the sense of he's done well at this level before, but so we'll get him in rather than having an overarching strategy. And that's a little bit of a concern that I've got with Zisco Munoz, because I feel like it was probably Chan Siri saying, looking down at the list of managers who have won promotion from the championship before and saying Zisco Munoz is one. And I feel like it, that was a slightly different kettle of fish because, first of all, he was working with the likes of Shai Pedro and Ismail Asar, who are outstanding footballers. And secondly, he was coming in, I call it like a championship version of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, where you come in off the back of a disciplinarian and all of a sudden, because you've got really good man management qualities and people skills and you're a lovely person, that can sort of carry the momentum a long way. And it felt like that was the case for um, for Munoz. And actually, as a tactician, considering um, I don't think he had his, his badges by the point he got the Watford job, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm not sure how much um, thought went into the, the appointment. And I feel like the club desperately needs a sporting director to bring a bit of footballing intellect upstairs. Yeah, I mean, like what Dan said, he's had it's been 15 days since uh, since Moore was officially announced as you know d- departing the club, um, and we've got to this point. So you'd like to think that that he has made a, a calculated decision on uh, on who it was that he wanted. I think he was available. You know, he's not he's not only all the he's not all of a sudden just become available. He was available back then. So um, yeah, I, I like to think that talks have been held and things like that. Having said that, we know that Chan Siri doesn't do things in, you know, the the normal ways. Let's let's say he likes to do things his own way, um, which does concern me a little bit. I think you're right, we're a director of football. Uh, that is like the modern the modern way. The problem we've got, again, I come back to the, the chairman. Um he, he likes he's very hands on. The past two, two and a half seasons, they've been good because he's kind of took a, a step back and I don't think he would, I don't think he would appoint a director of football to be perfectly honest. So I think we've just, we've, we've just got to go with what we've, what we've got. I think nobody can um, deny that obviously he puts a lot of money into the club and that's probably the, the one main thing that, you know, as a, as a chairman that you need to do. So he's, he's at least doing that thing right. Um, mm. But but yeah, when you look at, um, you know, the, the appointment of, of Munoz, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really excite me. So I don't want to put a, a, a negative spin on it, but it, it, it's not one that really excites me. Having said that, I don't think there was anyone that's been mentioned that excites me either. Uh, and mm. I don't know whether that's just because the managers aren't available, whether it's we, we just can't afford them. I know I, I obviously it came out that Darren Moore wanted four times his wages um, and, and a three-year deal. Whether that's just whether do, that's, do you believe that claim? By the way, James. Well, it has to be true because I mean Darren Moore could could take him to the cleaners if it, if it's not true. To be fair, so yeah. I would I'd like to think it was. Um, I don't believe hardly anything that Chan Siri says, but you know, I, I, I'm sure he would have been given some some guidance and, and said that, you know what he can and can't say. So mm. um, you've got to you've got to take it as you know as believable. However, there's no context in that. We don't know how much he was getting paid. So yeah, you know, if 
if you're getting paid peanuts, he wants four lots of peanuts. So and, like... and Moore hasn't publicly denied those claims since, and no, it was uh, what about a week ago? So it... yeah, it was last Thursday when that was that was announced, and right. and I think Darren Moore knows that. that uh, sorry, Chan Siri knows that Darren Moore's not going to come out and and say those things. He's not that type of person. Um, so, so, so yeah, I, I did think that 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 um, that announcement and kind of it was a bit strange and probably not needed. I thought that that it might have been because, because... then I, I just just to jump in on that, James, if you don't mind. Um, I feel like I would defend Chan Siri on that issue a little bit because I think that when there's a parting of company with the manager who's just won promotion there's obviously a lot of pressure on the chairman as to why couldn't that deal be agreed and maybe but we'd moved on to... gib with as fans we'd moved on we were we were you know uh, a week and a bit down the line i think we'd all accepted that we're not going to find out but let's get a manager in and let's move on because we've got a championship season coming up i think we'd you know they, they, yeah there's people that want to know but ultimately if, you, if you're told you're not going to find out it just is what it is and we just you know as a fan base we just have to look to the future rather than keep looking back which you've been doing for for far too many years yeah i understand that but uh, i can also sympathize with chan theory's point of view which is that if um if the secrecy means that uh kind of comes at his own cost then i can sort of understand why he felt like he had to uh step in and, and clarify those things but i do but, challenge but Gabe, this is down. this is a man who who has had constant feedback about ticket prices had constant feedback about shirt prices how much things cost you know that the match day experience seems to be waning over, over the years and things like that so he gets all this feedback where he does get under the cosh but it seemed to, but this is the one that he addresses i think that there are more important things that are happening at that club rather than something that like james says is a week and a half away and we um, you know it's football right not everything gets answered in terms of these decisions with the with the manager and things like that and like, like like James said, we'd moved on. We were like, okay, look, it's not worked out. They, they couldn't they couldn't nail the contract in. That's all he had to say. But to come out and go, he wanted four times his money, and I'm not paying that. It's ridiculous. It's it's a little bit like, come on, pal. Like 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 James says, right? There's no there's no context there. Let's say that Darren Moore had a two hundred grand, uh, you know, two hundred grand contract for three years, and and now he wants another three years that adds up to four times that amount. Mm. You know, he weren't asking for. You know, there's no context to it. It, it, you know, it, it was just yeah. an absolute misnomer of a statement that, that didn't need to be made because nobody really actually questioned that uh, apart from a week ago when some of the fans at the fans forum went, why is the gaffer gone? We couldn't, we couldn't agree terms. Okay, cheers. But for some reason, he has to have these long meandering answers that take forever to, to talk about and he has to have the last word on everything because he's one of those, essentially one of those rich people that doesn't really give a toss about what, your average working man in the street has an opinion on. It's only when it affects him personally does he then get on his high horse. I, 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 you know, am I right there, James, or am I being a knobhead there? Like, you know what I mean? Am I being out of order? Yeah, I think, Gabe, I think you can probably tell that we're not that um, impressed <laughs> with the chairman. Yeah. <laughs> or is that not coming no. across? <laughs> And, and, and listen, don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of issues with uh, with Dayfon Chan Theory's um, running of the club, and um, certainly the refusal to appoint a sporting director or someone with some footballing um, sort of nous. I think is absolutely crazy because otherwise you're asking mm -hmm. someone who's coaching the team. And lots of issues that Dan mentioned there, I'm perfectly happy to to agree with in terms of ticket pricing and communication. I think there's been a lot of issues. Um, I think yeah, I, what comes what it comes down to is. As a chairman or an owner of a football club, you don't need to. People say I didn't know anything about football, and for me, that's not really an issue. Like you can, you can know absolutely nothing. There's, there's quite a lot of owners up and down the football league and the Premier League that, that, again, don't know a great deal about football. People from the states, for example, you know that, that have come over. But if what you've got to do is surround yourself with people that do, and surround yourself with people that that have got that pedigree and they've got that you know, intelligence and know-how and experience. And unfortunately, he's not done that. So then it, then it does come down to a fact that he doesn't know a great deal about football because um, mm. he's, he's not taking on the, the advice of, I, of doing I, yeah. that. I, I completely agree with you on that, James. Um, but I also think that the fact that, that so much of what you said is true means that Dayfon Chan Theory, whenever a, such a controversial move like the decision to part company with Darren Moore does happen, 
uh, lots of people are instantly going to assume that it's because Dave Fon Chancery has unrealistic expectations or that he's, uh, you know, not, and Darren Moore's only being the reasonable one, and act when actually the situation might have been more complex. So I actually can yeah. sympathize with the call there, to there, offer is, there is an element of that gap. There, there, there really is. Don't get me wrong. He wanted to stick up for himself. I, 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 I completely understand. But what this comes across is, is, is something that's really childish, right? So as James yeah. said, right, that we've been in League One for two years. We, we've hardly seen him. Right, he's, he's he's not even been in the country. Like, it, yeah. I, I think was it when I was talking to you last week, James? Did it? Did I liken it to like imagine a toy we used to play with as kids? Like, you get a transformer toy and the leg falls off, and you're like, oh, I don't want to play with that anymore. And you put it down, right? And then two years later, it's been fixed, or you've been bought a new one. And you're like, I want to play with this again. You know mm. what I mean? This is mint, this toy. And then mm. let's say you get the big add-on, the new gun that comes with a transformer, ergo Premier League. Um, Premier League promotion. Now he really wants to play with it. He can't wait to play with it. it, it it's genuinely like a child. Like it, it's like that bit in Toy Story where he goes, "Oh, you're broke. I don't want to play with you anymore." And and yes, that's kind of that. it. And now all of a sudden, now we're back in the Championship. Here he is. We can't we can't get him off the telly now. You, you know what I mean? Dan, he, I love your analogies, by the way, mate. I, I, <laughs> I could listen to him for days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no. No. I, I totally. I totally see where where you're coming from for sure. Um, let's talk about uh, the uh, the squad at Sheffield Wednesday, James. Because when normally when after you've won promotion, there is an instinct for uh, keeping things together and you know maybe not having too much of a squad churn. But then speaking to Wednesday, I it's even speaking to one or two people within the club. There's definitely a feeling that actually we're looking at eight to ten players here. Is that is that something that you would share as a fan base? Yeah, I've said it all along. I think we do need double figures in terms of new additions coming in, whether that's permanent signings or or loan signings as well. Um, I think we've got quite a good nucleus of a side um, that we've that's, that's come up from from League One. I think the problem is, is if we'd have come up that first season, uh, I felt like the the first season we got relegated, we we probably had a, a championship quality side and we just came unstuck a little bit. You know, the the agricultural nature of some of the League One teams, um, we we just come couldn't really break them down and then in the, in the second season sorry james um, i'm laughing i really love that term agricultural nature that's a very <laughs> polite way of putting it pal i really enjoyed that uh, well you know um everyone knows what i mean um in, <laughs> in, the, in the second season we had to sign players such as ben hennigan um you know that that was league one uh that, that have done it in league one before i mean michael Ahequa, michael smith although i think they, they're good enough to step up you know they'd done it the season before as well we brought players in that that had them, them league one qualities and then unfortunately that's the season that we then get out of the league and we now need to you know move some of them on and and bring in some some of those championship quality players that we perhaps had the season before so yeah i think you know when you look at the likes of barry bannon josh windass george byers that that's and will i've got to have will volks in there as well there's four players there that are you know i think most championship sides would be would be happy to have have those in and when three of them are in your midfield um i think that that does stand as in, would, in good stead would most championship sides be happy to have will volks in it I think he's got some some great qualities. To be fair, he's a as a holding midfielder. Um, he's played quite a lot of his football in the championship. Obviously, with with Cardiff as well. Um, I, I think, yeah, he's, he's, he can slow the game down when needs be. Um, he's he's good on the ball. He can pick out a, a decent pass. He's he's very knowledgeable as well. I know you know you can look back at the Barnsley game where he got caught on the ball and that ends up you know with us conceding quite a vital goal to be fair but but other than that I mean you've seen some of the goals he scores as well he scored he only scored two last season but they were two absolute worldies from uh, from you know 20 30 yards so yeah I think I think Will Volks is a you know would would fit in I said all right not any, not every championship side but I'm sure there would be some championship sides that would uh, that would have him in like I said, the, the midfield is probably the one area where, where we're where we're all right at the moment. But it's just about bringing really? those. I, I actually feel like you're missing a, a really a super athletic box the box midfielder, personally. Yeah, I mean, Delhi Bashiru could probably could have been that person, but you know we know how that went on. He was he was awful for us. Just didn't really apply himself. I'm not saying that we don't need to go out and sign anyone in midfield. It's not I, when you're signing ten players, you can't. We're not just going to sign ten defenders and attackers and, and goalkeepers. You know, there will be some midfielders thrown in there. But I just think that on the whole, when you look at the 
the the players that we that we have got currently. It's not a lot, by the way. You know, we've, we've had half the under twenty ones or all the twenty ones training with us the past mm-hmm. couple of days. We do need a lot of players, but um, it, it's not not only first team regulars. I think it's, like last season we came a little bit unstuck with strength in depth. We thought we had it, but it come come the end of the season, we, there was very limited options, especially on the bench to to change a game. See, I, um, I have, I think that the, I, I can see why James has made the point that midfield is such a strong point because Barry Bannon, we know, we know what we can expect from him. Technically, uh, George Byers was probably one of the best midfielders in League One last season, arguably the best. Um, but I, um, I feel like because with Bannon, that there's these situations. I don't know how often they happen for Sheffield Wednesday, but I've certainly seen it. Dan on one or two occasions where Bannon is actually on the edge of the penalty area uh, because he's that technician who can strike a ball. But actually, uh, that can make Wednesday a little bit vulnerable to the turnovers because if the ball is turned over, Bannon can't run back and sort of try and put a challenge in. So for me, I think there needs to be legs in midfield, someone who's really strong, who could got incredible stamina. I think that's what's needed in midfield. And I just don't, I think Will Vox is solid enough. But for me, Will Vox should be a rotation or squad option rather than actual starter. So I'll be looking to get someone in there. So you're thinking somebody like uh, an enforcer, our very own... No, 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 a box-to-box. Oh, a box-to-box. Yeah, box-to-box. It's it's interesting you pick pick on Barry Bannon, actually, because there was... He's got legs. (laughs) He he has got legs. It's weird, actually, because there's something that the Sheffield Wednesday fans tend to pick up on, on Bannon. And it is his... Is box edge of the box play, but not at the other end of the pitch where you'd think. Uh, under Darren Moore, he got forward a, a lot more, and it was a you know, because he can absolutely unleash a ball and knows what he's doing with a football. I'd have him there all day, as long as you're quite right, we have somebody behind him, which is what Byers and Volks tend, tended to do because you know, a lot, a lot of our football goes through him. The issue that we had a couple of years ago under Gary Monk and under Tony Pulis, maybe I don't know, none of us saw him. Um, there was a there, there was an issue where what Barry would do, and I don't know whether he was instructed to do this or not. So, you know, Barry, I'm not, you know, this this isn't me on a dig. You're better at football than me. But there would be a point where he would drop right to the back of the D on our own line, separate the centre-backs and kind of turn us into a back five. So Barry could, yeah, could, could play out a quarterback. Now, the issue from that is, is if it comes back, Geezer's five foot two. Do you know what I mean? And and it it, kind of, we've got our centre-backs out of position. So we, what under more what we did was was push him forward and and you're right yeah we do need somebody behind him um i volks and buyers for me uh we you know we had a guest on our show that said uh, that used the phrase that buyers volks and bannon don't tell his missus is his new favorite triangle which you know i thought was a was a great way of putting it i think we are more in the in the market probably for a big enforcing center back somebody like aiden flint 8 years ago aiden flint we need somebody like that. I think somebody to absolutely grab it by the scruff of the neck and pull it, pull it tight. Now we've signed Reese James and we've signed Marvin Johnson, and they 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 fit into that uh, three five two, you know five three two, whatever we were playing. But this, but Chisco when now he's going to come in, is he's, he's renowned for playing four two three one. So we're going to need two enforcing midfielders. Where does Bannon sit in that? Is he going to be the advanced midfielder where we've played Windass? Is Windus going to move to to the wing somewhere? Who's who's going to be the enforcing midfielder? Things like that. There's there's a lot of questions coming in now because we don't have a lot of players signed on. There's a really exciting point here, where my my podcast colleague Blair said, is that we've got a point where we do need a, another eight to ten players, you know, to get the depth in the squad, and instead of getting charged British, you know, these British player taxes that people talk about about paying paying through the nose and over the odds for British players. There might be, instead of a 500 grand centre-back, there might be a 50 grand centre-back that can just do the job in Spain that our new gaffer knows about, you know, things like that. So with us getting the manager, albeit I wish we did it, you know, three weeks ago, but with us getting a new gaffer at this time in the in the season, before the season starts, there might be some exciting signings coming Sheffield Wednesday's way of players that we don't really know. Well, let's let's hope that's the case. Um, in terms of the centre back position, then James Dan alluded. To... Sorry, Gab, your uh, your audio has just cut out there, pal. Try <laughs> go again, that's mate. Uh, I can audio? hear you, Gab. It's fine. Okay, oh. we'll we'll ignore you. <laughs> no, um, 
<laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear again. Perfect. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the centre back position, Dan there alluded to uh, the, um, the the change to the back four um, and uh, Ziske Munoz, which we'd probably be expecting. Um, so I'm kind of wondering, what do you think the the back four would look like? Presumably, Liam Ka pa Liam Palmer, Liam Palmer um, being Palmer at right back. Yeah, but obviously, yeah, we've got we've got Liam Palmer. The other two we've got is Dominic Iorfa, Michael Ahekwa. Uh, and then you know, you've got either Marvin Johnson or Reese James. I'm guessing if you're playing a back four, you'd probably go with Reese James at, at left back. If I'm being being perfectly honest, so we have we have got a, a back four there. If you are playing Dom at, at centre back, but I think it's going to be interesting because when when you look at the, the championship, you know, you know, we, we mentioned you know Aidan Flint there, great in League One. I don't think that's what you need in in the championship. Not um, in a back four, maybe exactly three, but not back four. Exactly. So it's going to be interesting, you know, who, who we might bring in. And you know, we had Mark McGuinness, obviously, the early part of last season. He would be fantastic to to bring in someone someone like that. Um, it, you know, more football is going to be played. It just is in in the championship. That's just what you that's just what you see. You don't see the the long ball. You know, you don't really need to. Obviously, yeah, you need to head the ball. Of course, it's it's, it's still a game of football, but it's not going to be done as much as what it perhaps is done. You know, in in League One, you know, you're not coming up against a a Gillingham or or a Wickham of the past. Let's uh, let's say there's there's no teams like that. So it's going to be interesting. Um, I, I must admit, I don't know a great deal about the style of football that that Munoz likes to play. I know he's he's from speaking to a Watford fan. He likes these teams to be defensively solid, which is obviously a good thing. You know, um, I know the chairman wants top six. How much of that we can, you know, take as gospel, I don't know, but. I think the, the the first thing is, like you said at the top, we just need to survive in the division. So the fact that you know he likes a defensively solid side that does that does please me. You know, I, I don't want the gunko football of you know if you score three, we'll score four because you can come unstuck quite quickly with that. So mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting to see what sort of defenders he brings in and what type of defender he brings in. Like Dan alluded to there, you know, we could see some of these. Um, international players that, that are coming in, some Spanish players that he's, that he's perhaps either played with or managed before. Um, and yeah, it's just, it is going to be exciting to see the players come come rolling in. Might be a couple of weeks late, but you know there's still plenty of weeks left until the start of the season. Yeah, for sure. Dan, I think you get the feeling centre-back from what James has said is going to be uh, quite a significant area for Wednesday to address. You'd put left-back in that um, conversation as well, wouldn't you? I, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I think I think it, it like like James says, it all it all comes down to what sort of um, what sort of formation we want to play. I mean, we you know I mentioned earlier that Darren Moore took six months to get his um, get his ducks in order with who he's going to play um, and, and what formation is going to play. But you know, I we we tried to play four at the back and came unstuck. We tried to play three at the back with two wingers. We came unstuck. We've got James. We've got Johnson. We've got Ihekwe. I think we might need somebody to supplement for Maywo for me because I I feel like we're missing an absolute enforcer at the back. I think what's difficult, Gabe, as well is obviously having just been promoted. And we, you know, we did so well in terms of the amount of points that we've got. You know, we, had, we, you know, we didn't lose many games. I know it wasn't pretty to watch sometimes. It's very difficult to say who's who's good, who's not, when you've not tested yourself against anyone at the moment. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we might, we, you know, the, the first two or three games we've got obviously a tough start against Southampton. I think then we um, then we travelled to Hull and then. I can't remember with the third, third third game. I know we've got Leeds fairly fairly soon as well. So we've got a really tough start. It might be after the first couple of couple of games. Then you, we can really say, oh, we need this is where we need to improve. I know at that point it could be too late, which is where you trust. You've got to trust the manager when he comes in. And you've got to hope that that he, you know, having having played in, or having managed in this this league, hopefully, fingers crossed, when he sees the team that he's got, he can go, yeah, I need, you know, I need a first team replacement, or he might just say, I, what I've got good enough in that, in that particular area and I, I just need some backup players um because that you know competition for places is going to be is going to be key and and not only that just injury replacements because we know at Sheffield Wednesday I'm sure you know fans of other clubs that might be listening to this are thinking it's the same at my club as well but we always get injuries always and again last season 
we had Windass injured, we had Byers injured, and we thought we were going to be all right, and is, is, we came unstuck. Is it a sports science thing, James? Do you think? Because I've we've brought one of them in. <laughs> we've we've tried. Apparently, everyone's tried everything, and I've no idea what it is. The only the only common denominator is the training ground. But surely, the facilities surely. are awful by all accounts, aren't they? Yeah, well, they're not great. I, I said I wasn't. It's an upside down bouncy castle that we've got on a concrete car park. That's essentially what our training ground is. Yeah, I said I weren't around in the nineties, but I think if if I, if I was, it would probably look exactly the same. I don't think it's changed, to be fair, which is which is poor, really. Um, but as as football fans, you don't want to see money being spent on uh, on training grounds and things like that. You want players brought in, and he spent quite a lot of money doing that. And in hindsight, he perhaps should have spent his money elsewhere looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's an interesting one, Dan, isn't it? Because most clubs that come up like to have that continuity where, although they're testing themselves at higher level, they've still got the blueprint that got them up there. And I'm just wondering with Sheffield Wednesday, you're going to have 10 new players, you're going to have a new manager, you're going to have a new formation, you're going to have a new sporting director. It's all new. And I sometimes wonder that with uh, Chan Series saying we want to get top six, is there almost an element of delusions of grandeur where the club's going to try and walk before it actually, no, going to try and run before it walks. There we go. Yeah, absolutely. But th there's also an element of it's Sheffield Wednesday. Like, and, and like James says, you know, I know a, probably, a, a lot of other clubs probably say phrases something like, well, we're going to Wednesday it up or, you know, we're going to Lincoln City it up and we're going to Peterborough it up. But, but with us, there seems to be this genuine deep-seated thing where... We don't always get it right, uh, but there is something exciting about it. Like there is something sat, like deep rooted where we're going to go. Well, what it, what's it going to be this week? Are we going to get spanked by Southampton first game of the season, or are we going to win two nil and then that's it? We're winning the league, and we're all going to get carried away by ourselves before we before we drop our ass out of it in match. Like you you, you never know. Uh, you know, there's that there's that really famous meme with. Uh, Gino Gattuso going sometimes maybe good sometimes maybe. and that's us right that's that's exactly that's exactly what we are we could sign 10 players we could get in the playoffs we could be absolutely be, be on the verge of the season of our lives but we could also go absolutely circling the drain for a long eight nine months and then fall back into league one and get overtook by Derby County which would be the worst thing I probably the problem we've got Gabe is the, is the fact that you know all right, he's come out and said he wants top six, but then you look and in the next breath, he says that, you know, FFP is, is a thing and we've got, you know, £14 million that we can spend or whatever in terms of losses this season. Now, I know Leicester obviously just come down from the Premier League and they've got the parachute payments and all things like that, but they're spending money left, right and centre. I think I read something where certain teams that have got up, gone up from the Premier League are losing a million pound a week. That's fifty-two million pound in 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 a year that they're losing to to get yourself out of this league, and where I think he's probably looked at Sunderland, who've gone up and up again. Or, or right, they, they was up there, they got into the playoffs. Luton, who've perhaps done it on a shoestring. Yeah, but they, well. they're smart clubs, though, James. That's the thing. They, but yeah, exactly. But I think he's looked at those and thought, oh, well, I can do exactly the same, not realizing that yeah, they've had you know they've got infrastructure be behind them, and they've probably got a plan as well. Something yeah. that I don't think we have clearly. It's evident that of the that what's happened in the past two or three weeks. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, Luton have had Paul Watson, a sporting director, who did an incredible job. Sunderland have got Christian Speakman as technical director. Both those clubs recruit really well. So uh, I think that, it's what yes, it's one thing to say you can come up and make an impact, but you've got to have a way better structure than, than Jeff or Wednesday have got. And um, yeah, that's my uh, that's my real sort of concern with the club at the moment. Um, let's talk attack, Dan, because um, if it's just going to be the one up top for this game, I mean, us in terms of starting strikers you've got Michael Smith who I would say probably plays best with a partner you could argue that's true of, of Lee Gregory as well um I think some pace is definitely needed to add to the attack um how are you feeling about things at the moment uh with a 4-2-3-1 manager coming in and if we you know if, if that's what we decide we're going to plump for I'm concerned about that attacking midfielder now obviously we'd look at Josh Windass and go yo it's probably going to be you and he's essentially going to be partnering the big man up front now during the, uh, the drop off of our season March when Windass was um, when Windass was injured we went for two up front under more back end of last season and they Gregory and Smith are very similar players 
and I they think... need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, if I, if I'd argue, but you know, if I was nitpicking, Gregory tries a lot harder. There's a, there's a lot more tenacity it's, to, to Gregory's it's game. More of a target man, though. I would say he is. He's an absolute good telegraph pole parked on their, um, parked on their, you know, on their penalty spot. But he has to work a lot harder for his goals if he's up there on his own. When Windass is behind him, he's there all day. And but uh, but Gregory will sniff one out a little bit more. But the, what I mean is they they play the same position as it were. They both need Windass playing off him, and mm. that that for me, given Windass has, has has had some you know pretty nasty injuries the last two seasons that have taken him out for an elongated period of time, I'd be I would look at strengthening that position because I think Gregory and Smith leave him to it. Right, leave them to it. Uh, you know they they'll do a job at League One. They'll do a job in the Championship, or or we will find out in the first month. But I think the most important role is that attacking midfielder, or what you kids call number nine nowadays. I, I think that that's number ten. Oh, number ten was the big shit kicker striker when I was a kid. Is it number ten behind yes, the number so nine? Yes, so number no. ten is now the attacking midfielder. The number nine is the centre forward. Come on, Dan, get get with some, the times, man. Someone's going to have to send me some emails. I used to play footy manager, and it was attacking midfielder, centre or forward, centre. You know, what I'll, I mean? Dan, I'll send you a copy of Football Manager. You can have a play with that, mate. You'll be, <laughs> Thanks, you'll, be you'll be calling it a cam next and a CDM yeah. and all things like that. So, so you need, I'm, I'm so you, need right another, you need another centre half. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, and, and MW formation. No, so there, there is there is genuinely a so at the attacking midfielder, the guy that plays off the shoulder of the striker. I think that is the most important position. Really, though, because you've got Windass who plays that, and yeah. let's not forget, let's not take Barry Bannon out of this equation because we're thinking Barry Bannon plays better further forward. Are you playing Barry Bannon as part of a two-man double pivot? I, I'm yeah, very I, worried about that. You know, I team. think I think if we played Bannon and whoever we've got in the squad now, I mean, we tried Liam Palmer in the middle of the park, you know, sat next to Bannon, one attacking, one defending behind behind Windass and two attacking midfielders, then I, I, I feel that that's probably the way to go. I th- no, you know. I, I don't think so. I think if you play Barry Bannon, you need two midfielders who've got legs around him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, 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 in Volks and Byers is, is essentially what we've done. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to square peg round hole this entire season into having bought all these players that fit into a 5-3-2 to then all of a sudden go, right, we're playing a completely different formation now, lads. So, uh, you know, do that. Yeah. <laughs> Gabe, you, you mentioned about pace and, and things like that, and I 100% agree with you because I think we do need that. Last season, I think we got away with it just because we were we were the team to beat. Teams came up against us and they were quite happy to sit back. Mm. There was no space in behind most teams that, that either came to Hillsborough when we went away. So, you know, whenever whenever they lost the ball, they got back into their shape really quickly. And it was, you know, it was, you know most teams were fairly difficult to break down. So you're not really, you know, the fact that we didn't have any pace didn't really affect us. It did in a sense that, you know, when there was a counter attack on mm. and we didn't have any pace, we were, you know, we were crying out for it um, when you sat in the stands. But for, over the course of the season, like I said, I mean, the fact that we got as many points as we did, clearly it wasn't that much of an issue. But going into the championship, there's going to be teams, teams are going to come up, you know, are going to come to Hillsborough and they're going to think they're going to get three points or they're going to target us as a, as a team that we can that we can be, especially given what's happened. I know the landscape can change come, you know, the start of the season and whenever it is that we play these these sides. But I think teams are gonna there's gonna be a lot more room in behind. You know, the the, the counter attack will be will be on. We're not gonna dominate teams as much as what we dominated them last season. Having said that, you know, we didn't have a masses of possession, but we, you know, it was well over half every yeah. single game that, that we, to that be we honest, had. I, I actually felt like it was a little bit sluggish at times last season. Like I remember watching first half. It's an old the, side, Gabe. It's a really old yeah. side. It was the oldest side in the league. So but, that's, but that's going to be expected. This is the thing. I think you relied on individual quality at times last season, but there were times, I remember the first half of the MK Dons game where it was like, you had to wait so long for the overlapping runs and you just couldn't get any momentum. And then I think second half, um, Gregory came on for Volks and that just completely changed it. But um, I definitely think pace and athleticism is absolute must for the, for the championship. I, yeah, I really do. I think that's so important. Yeah, definitely. Because like I said, there is going to be more 
more space in behind, and that's where he's, where your pace is more exploited. And you know you can turn teams around quicker if you've got pace out wide. If we're you know if we're playing a four two three one, let's not forget we've got Malik Wilkes, a player that but most most Wednesday fans will have forgotten about because he hardly played last season. You know a few cameos off the bench, but it was it was injured for most of it. I mean it was unfit when he first came. He then got injured. Um, we saw glimpses of, glimpses of him, and he's got he has got pace. But like what I said, we didn't never really. By the way, James, because did he get injured? Uh, no, Alex Martin. Well, we played a three-five-two, and he's not a wing back. So, oh, yeah. oh, so sense. like it, it, it was just <laughs> it was just massively out of position. It, it, it wasn't being played in a. You know, his, his best game he had is we played a four-two-two-two, um, like mm. a bit of a you know off centre formation when we played Morecambe. And that's probably one of the best games that he had. But he was played out wide where he needs to play. Whereas playing as a wing back, you know, young winger that just wants to get forward, it just didn't work whatsoever. So I don't think Darren Moore's um, plan was to play five three two or four or, or three five two for for as long as what he actually did. I think the injuries came in and also we were doing quite well playing that formation so he probably just stuck with it and, and thought you know what we'll just we'll just roll with it and, and unfortunately because it, it brought Corbiano in the season before it brought Martin in um last season players that don't fit a 3-5-2 and we just ended up playing that formation so mm. so yeah it was just it's just unfortunate we Wilkes we'd bought him so we were stuck with him <laughs> yeah it com comes back to joined up thinking throughout the club and that's what Sheffield Wednesday they're going to need if they're going to make uh, meaningful progress at championship level because they're not going to have the individual quality relative to the level to sort of uh, to rely on. So I think that's going to be such an important thing and whether that's going to happen while Chantiri's owner, um, I, I, I really I, I struggle to see it. Um, how are you feeling about the goalkeeping position at the moment, Dan? We need a new one. We need a new, better one. Now, uh, <laughs> now, you coming to me about the goalkeeper, uh, the irony is not is not wasted on me, Gab. So I've not been Dawson's biggest fan, um, well at all. Uh, and <laughs> and we we had a review on our podcast from Cameron Dawson, literally slagging me off. So uh, I'm glad you've come to me for this one, Gab. I'm really excited about it. So um, Cameron Dawson was essentially one of the worst goalkeepers the club's ever seen before the COVID break. Uh, you know, there, notably, there was a couple of games, like, for example, January 2020, uh, we conceded five at home to Blackburn. And there was one where the ball bounced off the post and came off the back of his head. And then fast forward, you know, nine, ten weeks, and we were away at Brentford and got spanked again, 5-0, and he was at fault for about four of them. Um, there was a couple of... And then he went on loan to Exeter after the season restart, went on loan to Exeter. By all accounts, had a good season with them. He did, yeah. A very good season. Who cares? Do you know what I mean? Like, he's gone Exeter. Well done. That's like that's like me winning, you know, tallest in my house against my cat or or winning the league with Dynamo Tbilisi like Chisco Munoz or, you know, winning the Scottish League with Celtic. Like, it's just, like, well done. Do you know what I mean? You're, you're a championship brought up keeper and you've had a good season at Exeter. You should have. And then he came back and he dropped the ass out of, out of a few saves. But he also, there were some outstanding saves he made during last season. Most notably, there's a couple at Wembley. There was some uh, there was some big ones in the in the um, in the five one win. But let's not forget, he was also at fault for you could argue three of them when we got spanked four 0 by Peterborough in the first leg. So, I guess what I'm saying is now, yes, he has come back a better keeper from Exeter. But I also think it's a position I want a Kieran Westwood back. I want an established keeper who's in his late 20s, early 30s, because that's that English football bullshit that we like. I want somebody who is an established, good goalkeeper. I don't want to give a chance to somebody and have that plucky underdog and let's get another Bailey Peacock Farrell because he might come good. I don't want any of that. What I want is a really good goalkeeper. Let's do that. Let's get one of them. Somebody who's going to grab those people in front of him, organise his defence, and make sure that we're not conceding goals to stupid corners and set pieces, which is which James will attest to, was a massive issue of ours at one point. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you've been a little bit harsh if I'm being perfectly honest, Dan, on on Cam Dawson. But I suppose, yeah, you still uh, you've still got a bit of needle <laughs> with with him. But I think he did, you know. I think going to Exeter was was good for him, just for confidence more than anything. Like and the fact that mm -hmm. he got promoted with him, he's you know he's had back to back promotions. If you'd have seen. If we'd assigned Cameron Dawson this season, having looked at his Palmares and, and what he'd what he'd done and where he'd been and, and everything like that, you would 
you'd be delighted with him. The fact that his name's Cameron Dawson, I think, is what people turn their nose up at. I think I agree, Dan. I think we do, you know, if we did bring in someone like you've just said, that would be fantastic. But I don't think we're going to get that type of no, that type no of player. Um, and then you, you know, you could argue you could bring in someone similar to to Cam Dawson in terms of ability and have competition for the places. But I'm a firm believer that across all the other positions, competition for places in the goalkeeper department, when you make a mistake, it's normally a goal. And how you know, for me personally, if if, if that's if you're if you know that you make a mistake and you're going to get dropped, it's not really going to make me not make any mistakes. I, I, you have that in the back of your mind. I feel like you just need a solid number two to, to as backup that when needed, bit when you know when they need to be called up upon, they're going to do a job. Um, I don't, but someone to be fair, you know like Stockdale, who we just had. I thought he would have been fantastic to stay on as a number two. With all the stuff he was doing behind the scenes, you know, you could tell the, the camaraderie between between him and, him and Dawson, knowing that he's going to be he is going to be number two, Dawson's going to be number one, and, and they could help each other. Um obviously he's gone to York to pursue other you know another role which but yeah someone like a, an experienced goalkeeper who knows he's going to be number two i think cameron dosa deserves a chance in the championship he's already played there uh, before but james are we not are we not past the point of giving somebody a chance we've just fought tooth and nail because we got caught cheating with the finances and we end up getting caught and got sent down to league one i don't want to give somebody a chance i want established you know but we're not going to get him down level. and, and, and him. i know we're not because if even so if there's no point far, that, do you know what I mean, but even no if point. you look as far as the, the manager, right? So I was writing down like you know some some notes for this show, and we have a bit of an issue here that like you know we, we spoke about Dean Smith, for example, right? We talked about Dean Smith. We talked about I think Paul Ince got mentioned, and then Darren Ferguson today before we announced Chisco. But what we've what we've had we've had Chisco forty two, Darren Moore. What was he, late 30s, early 40s? Ignore Tony Pulis for 20 days. Before that, we've had Gary Monk. The reason being is, is that these managers are in their late 30s, early 40s at the start of their managerial career. And the main thing that they've got is cheap. Do you know what I mean? They're cheap because they're trying to start their career. Now, Dean Smith's a more established at a, a, a certain level and he would have been expensive. So we're already cutting corners with the calibre of manager that we're getting because he's cheap. Now, as well, soon what as about start... Michael Carrick and Rob Edwards who are right at the um, the precipice of their managerial careers, both did outstanding, outstanding work in the championship last season. I, th I think that Michael, you know, Michael Carrick com comes from comes from a rich rich pedigree of, of where he's played. Rob Edwards is one of those freak of natures where they, where they come out of absolutely nowhere. But for every Rob Edwards, there's another Gary Monk. Do you, do you know what I mean? There are there are a hundred Gary Monks that you know, and the issue the issue that we've got is we're already trying to save money in the top job at, at the club, and I just don't think we're going to chuck the money. We're not going to the money we've saved there. We're not going to put into there because we've already got an overinflated wage bill, and we've got a chairman who's trying to tighten the purse strings already because he's already nearly two hundred million in the in the hole. So. Like, you know, for, the, for the, the best example I can give you is that Wolves and Sheffield Wednesday around 2016 to 2018, I'd, I'd have argued we're, uh, we're on a level playing field. They got their Nuno and we didn't. Their Nuno was the difference between between the clubs. Uh, you know, yeah, Cavalier well, wasn't um, Nuno. Interesting. I think uh, Wolves at the time had um, were able to sign Ruben Neves, for example, who mm -hmm. played in a... Champions League quarterfinal with Porto. You're dead right, but we spunk ten million quid on Jordan Rhodes. We had, we had, we had a sim. We were opening the purse strings back then. Yeah, you know? I, don't, I don't think you can compare everybody. Jordan Rhodes as a footballer to Ruben Neves. No, you can't. But we plump for him, and they plump for him, and that's the difference. They had, they just got it slightly better than we did. Well, we they had the agents' connections, though. didn't they? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So if if we're already tightening the purse strings on somebody with the connections who's only in his early 40s. Imagine if we'd have got a Nuno in who'd got his connections, we could have been the one signing Neves. I just think when you look at the goalkeeper department, Dan, if you look at when we've got limited resources to spend, are you going to spend that on the goalkeeper? Or are you going to spend that elsewhere? And 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 as much as you need a good goalkeeper, yeah, granted, and they can save you a lot a lot of points. I think in other areas of the of the squad, you you can you can spend that money better personally. And I just don't think we're going to get the the sort of goalkeeper that we mine. 
that everyone everyone wants. I could be I, I could be totally wrong. I don't I, I don't know. I is just it, think then, that is, I, is if Cameron like, Dawson's number one next season, I'm I'm happy with that. If we're saying ten signings though, James, because I suppose we've got to make the distinction between what we feel Sheffield Wednesday need and what's actually going to be likely. So are we actually looking at fewer signings than eight or ten and more like four or five? We still need a goalkeeper. I've not said that we don't need one. I just think that I don't think we'll get a new a new number one. I think that it's going to be a backup goalkeeper that we that we bring in. Um, I just don't think that you know as as big as what Sheffield Wednesday are and as big as what we like to think we are. When you've got you know limited resources to spend, and let's let's not forget that money that I've just mentioned that that with FFP, that's not just transfer budget. That's money lost. That's that's just that comes out of wages and everything. And we all know that. We don't run a sustainable model at Sheffield Wednesday. Like commercially, it's really, really poor. We haven't got, um, you know, an infinite num- number of revenue streams. We're not a selling club. We don't, we don't bring any money in from, from player sales. Lucas Joao was the last player that we, that we sold. So, you know, I just don't think the the the, the players that we that we look at and want to bring in. I think we should be shopping in the free and loan market. To be fair, look if we can bring a decent loan goalkeeper in, then great. But then again, you could go what back to what you're saying, Dan, is, and it's going to be a, a taking a chance on a young young Premier League goalkeeper. Look, it's worked for some people. Look at uh, what's his name? Traff- is it Trafford? Who's uh, who looks like he's going to be going to Burnley for yeah. an obscene amount of money? Tell, um, tell you what, if you could get him on loan, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? That would be fantastic. Yeah, and there was also the the, the lad I forget who was at Portsmouth the season before that ended up at Southampton as uh, well. So, yeah, it can happen, but obviously they're League One clubs that are, that are taking a chance on him. It's a bit different when you when you are in in the championship, but you never you never know. I just think we just need to manage his expectations somewhat um, for this yeah. season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in a few weeks, I've got to make my one to twenty four predictions. I've um, had a bit of stick off Wednesday at uh, for my predictions in recent years. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be absolute bedlam again. Um, but I wanted to get your help, really, the, the two of you. Um, which of you do you think is the more optimistic owl out of the two of you? I'm, I'm curious. Well, I don't know. What, what do you uh, reckon, uh, James? I'm, uh, I, I like to think I'm a realist. Okay. I, I'm normally glass half full, but I am. I am kind of. I am. I like to be optimistic in terms of let's back everyone, but then I, I do, I do, I, I mean, I've not got blue tinted glasses, put it that way. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, James, I'll give you the more positive question. Go on, which then. Is, what would be the reason for me to be hugely optimistic about Sheffield Wednesday's chances and think they could really surprise a few people and, and finish in the top half of the championship? The last time we did it in twenty was it what was it twenty sixteen under Carlos we were no, twenty seventeen you actually reached the playoffs yeah well the, also twenty twenty sixteen when we got to the final um, we were the surprise outfit and you know people didn't expect us to uh, you know to to do that and Carlos came in caught teams on the counter attack I think um, the, the manager's done it before he's got a team he's got a team promoted he's got that winning pedigree i think we've got a good nucleus of of team together it's very difficult for me to say that that now until i see all the players that that do come in uh, i think um you do see teams carry that momentum i know we've lost some of the momentum with the manager going and things like that however you know the the, the like i said the main nucleus of the team is still there and fingers crossed we can we can carry that into the next season Let's hope that's the case. You know what's coming then, Dan. What would be the reason for me to be really cautious about Wednesday and say this could be a bit of a dogfight? Have you seen how many good teams are in, <laughs> in that <laughs> league? It's mental. Like, like. So I'm just, I'm just going to get a list up of, of, of teams in the uh, teams in the uh, in the league. Now, I think Rotherham will have their perennial battle with staying up. I think uh, Huddersfield probably stay up because they've got Colin in charge. Uh, Cardiff seem to be in trouble. Bristol City seem to always seem to get out of it every year. Um, I think Plymouth will struggle, but you never know. They're a bit of an unknown quantity. And uh, and I think it's about time that the championship got rid of Stoke. But I I I can't I can't not tip ourselves to finish around that 15th, 16th mark. I feel like I feel like if I if I'm being completely honest, and you look at the size of some of the clubs, because even the clubs that I wouldn't normally worry about, for example, Coventry and Luton are are, are a great example. Um, you know, Blackburn have, have tried something else with John Dal Thomason and seem to be uh, farting around the playoffs. Um, 
I, uh, Ipswich, I think, will do really well. I think they'll sign really well. But then in there, you've got Leeds, Leicester, Saints, Millwall. Uh, sorry, Millwall, for some reason, who used to be everybody's essential whipping boys, are up there farting around the playoffs. You've got Norwich. You've got uh, Southampton, Sunderland, who, all of, who should be getting their ass handed to him, and they're finishing bloody playoffs. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Like, the teams that you would expect to to not do well have all of a sudden got their shit together. And it, and, and I'm like, it's going to be a long, tough season, this. I think it's going to be a really difficult season for Sheffield Wednesday. And if we had somebody good in goal that's not Cameron Dawson, <laughs> I think um, I think it's going to be a long season for us. And 15th, 16th seems low end of optimistically cautious. Don't ask um, Dan any questions about Cameron Dawson. Right, just making a note for uh, future reference. Um, <laughs> um, listen, gents, it's been such a pleasure to chat to you about Wednesday this evening. Thanks so much for your time. Um, James, what are your plans for the Wednesday till I die pod for next season? Uh, for next season, um, just carrying kind of doing what we're doing at the moment. We do a, uh, an episode every every Monday. Uh, we've expanded to four hosts now, so we've got even more waffle and talking absolute rubbish uh, every single uh, every single week. But no, it's, uh, it's great. You know, we're continuing throughout the summer uh, and then, yeah, we've got some some live shows planned as well uh, next season, which should be good in front of a live audience, which we all, uh, which we all like. Yeah, get some banana on, on, your, on your waffle. Um, that's awful, isn't it? Gav, that is absolutely terrible, mate. I, mean, I, 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 hope, I hope you've not been planning that one for a long time. And I hope that no, I haven't at all. I literally just thought, no, that's a bad one. <laughs> um, let's, let's swiftly move on. Uh, Dan, what are your plans for the Wednesday week for next season? How am I supposed to follow that gap, top end gags? How am I supposed to come after that? No, with the with the Wednesday week, we, we decided to try and start raising some money for charity, and we've. Um, I was going to take the summer off, but this club's mental. And I, I, honestly, James, after the playoff final, I was done. I was like, I just need a few weeks off. I'm done. With, I've done more recording since that game than I have done all season. Like, there's always something to talk about. Now, this is my third podcast of the evening. I need to stop, man. I need a, I, I need a day off. Yeah, well, hopefully you can have one or two of those, but some uh, hopefully a few transfers to come in as well over the next few weeks between now and the opening day of the season at Southampton. Um, gents, thanks so much for your time. Thanks to you for watching at home. This has been the EFL Debate Sheffield Wednesday Summer Deep Dive with James Mappin from the Wednesday Till I Die podcast and Dan Fudge from the Wednesday Week. Um, thanks to you and we'll see you again very soon. Cheers, guys.